So, it's been about two months since I published my recent video. I know, I work very slow. And there's been a lot of great discussions about what everyone wants for Ace Attorney 7. And by a lot, I mean a lot. It was honestly kind of shocking how many comments there were. And I went through a lot of them on stream, but I'm not expecting y'all to sit through two hours of me not knowing how to stream. So I'm making this video instead to organize all your thoughts, as well as adding my own thoughts to your thoughts. Does that even make sense? Why my rant is in the script? But anyways, there were a lot of great ideas being thrown around, as well as others that were less great, all which we'll be covering today. Plus, I wanted to just clarify some of the points I made in my own video while reading through all of these comments. Also, if these types of videos are cool because I really enjoy making these response type videos, do me a favor and hit that like button, subscribe, or comment even more ideas down below. Anyways, enough stalling, let's begin. So, from the very beginning when I was initially thinking of ideas for an Ace Attorney 7, Athena was always my number one candidate to be the main protagonist, mostly because I feel Athena has the most untapped potential out of all the characters in the series. And it's not just because she's only led two cases so far, or that she was sidelined in Spirit of Justice, but because Athena in general is just so unique compared to anything we've seen in Ace Attorney so far. Athena has just unbridled cheerfulness that was lacking from the other protagonists, and her focus in psychology and mainly the mood matrix is such a deep divergence from the standard that it could be the catalyst to doing something fresh with the franchise. But those differences are exactly why Athena is such a controversial character, with a lot of people either loving her or hating her, and ironically for very similar reasons. And even Ace Attorney seemingly doesn't even know what to do with her, so they kinda just phoned in her character and story arc and threw her to the wayside. Which sucks as once again, there's a lot of interesting potential here. But with how divisive Athena is, I was rather surprised to see how many people were on board with her being the protagonist. Some people were more unforgiving to the idea, but for the most part, everyone really wanted to see Athena's story continued. And it was eye-opening to see not only people receptive to the idea, but contributing their own ideas, theories, and stories they've written, which is just amazing. And it just proves that there is an audience that wants to see Athena's journey explored. We've already seen her backstory, we've seen why she wanted to become a lawyer, and now, we want to see her shine at being a lawyer. What originally made Athena so intriguing was that she had this friendly demeanor compared to the snarky and sarcastic quips from Phoenix and Apollo. And that openly positive perspective would clash with that stressful and heartless nature of the law. Having to toy with people's lives, decide who is guilty or innocent, and especially for Athena, not just feel, but experience the pain and emotions of her clients, the witnesses, and everyone in the courtroom. It's a compelling conflict that's just one of many possibilities of story arcs if fully realized. Athena is in such a unique position to have her journey be something special, discovering her own path, her own purpose. Not to mention that even the most demeaning criticism that Ivan called her, calling her the next my assistant, can be used to her advantage as we have yet to see that cheerful legal assistant turned into a lawyer before. And as Chuck McGill has once said, my affair can handle just fine, fine but my affair with a law degree is like a chip with a machine, machine gun. gun. But overall, I just want to take it back to another comment I got, basically comparing this hypothetical journey of Athena's to the struggles Phoenix himself faced in Justice For All. And I think that's a very fitting way to describe it. Phoenix had to find his own path to become the lawyer he is now, and now Athena has to do it herself. Take in all the advice, all the experience, all the inspiration, and turn it into hers. So, I previously said I wanted to see more returning prosecutors in the future, and with a long carousel of past prosecutors, a lot of names were being thrown around, the three most popular of which, which I've subsequently ranked being Number 3, Blackwell Athena's foil in Dual Destinies, but was honestly just a watered down version of Godot, and has since become more like an ally to Athena now. Number 2, Sebastian the Best, that young, naive, fledgling prosecutor like the rookie attorney had pitched. And number 1 being Franziska, which I have absolutely no idea how I overlooked it initially, despite me directly referring to the similarities between her and Athena. 
But thinking about it more, I can see Francisca being an excellent complementary opposite to Athena, similar to Edgeworth with Phoenix. Because as the aforementioned about the similarities between Athena and Phoenix's paths, Francisca pushed this flawed preconception of what a lawyer should be onto Phoenix in Justice for All, something she adopted from her father Manfred. And if she were to be the main prosecutor against Athena, we could see her continuing that development following her time as an Interpol agent, and most importantly, separating herself from that Von Karma creed and building her own independent path, like Phoenix and now Athena. Plus, it would be nice to see a matured Francisca who probably has her own advice for Athena, especially if she sees Athena as being the same youthful prodigy attorney she once was. That's not to say that we can't have others like Black or Sebastian be featured, but only really as a secondary role at most. And then, let's talk Kristoff real quick, as there was a little bit of pushback to my preposition about his return. And to some extent, I do agree, and ideally I think the main villain should be a new threat. But also, Kristoff's vindictiveness would be so compelling to delve further into, especially him being the main villain to Athena. Because while Francisca is the opposite in terms of circumstance and backstory, and Blackwell was more of a psychological threat like Athena, Kristoff was directly an emotionally manipulative bastard, someone that shows the dark side of toying with one's emotions, and it would make him be the perfect candidate being that in the shadows player, having others do his dirty work while he's still behind bars. And one conniving enough to possibly force his way out of prison, or even emotionally manipulate Athena and prey upon her weaknesses or sympathy. I mean, if Chris was able to be gifted a fancy little prison cell despite his conviction of murder, what stops him from using that conniving influence to do more? But that connection with emotions and the manipulation of emotions would bring into question Athena's own moral quandaries about psychology. And this was the point I wanted to get across when discussing the potential of a Christoph Athena face-off. And then there were many still wanting to have a rookie prosecutor, which once again, I'm not entirely against the idea. I too pitched my idea for one, but only if this rookie is entirely distinct from what we're used to. Because with the continual line of prolific prosecutors, it makes it more and more reliant you actually like the character behind the bench, and for every Godot, there's a Nyuta. And speaking of Godot, there are a surprising amount of people who really want to see a Godot return, but I'ma be honest, he's probably dead. I just want to briefly go over Apollo's return, because at first, it seems counterproductive to drag him back to the forefront and once again crowd up the right anything agency, especially when his story has, for the most part, been concluded. But it's those lingering threads of Apollo and Tracy's siblingship, and especially that strong connection between Apollo and Athena, that makes it seem almost inevitable. Which is why I feel it would be heavily beneficial to bring Apollo back. But I can only see Apollo returning in a limited role as a final case reveal, and concluding with the big three finally wrecking up together at their peaks. And plus, with a lot of Athena's confidence and charm coming from her partnership with Apollo, it would set up this heartfelt reunion between the two to cap off Athena's resurgence to greatness. But as someone who really likes Apollo and his cords of steel, gotcha! I would never put off another chance to see him again. But we need to fully commit to something new. And that new face should be Athena, not Apollo. In the comments, there were also a lot of Ace Attorney spin-off ideas, something that would honestly make a lot of sense. The series is currently in a limbo state with the release of the Apollo Justice Trilogy, so it would be a good time to tackle some potential spin-offs with the opportunity to tell new stories through them. So let's go over some of the most popular ideas. A Mia Fey Ace Attorney game was one of the most thrown out ideas, probably since the very beginning of the series. Now Mia is a very intriguing protagonist and mentor whose time was cut short. And even though we did see more of her backstory and connections with Godot and Phoenix in Trials and Tribulations, there's still so much more one can inform about her character between then and her death. Plus having a dedicated female protagonist like Mia is exactly what Ace Attorney needs at this point. Especially after seeing Mia, Athena, and Suzuto wrecking up in court, though very briefly. But between a Mia prequel and an Athena continuation, I would still prefer Athena. 
Athena has a higher ceiling and isn't restricted to needing to fit into a tight window of pre-established history. I just feel Athena has the space to grow into something more and bring her character into new heights, while Mia is just stagnant due to us already knowing her fate. The only thing a prequel would do is give her character some extra layers and build stronger character relations before her eventual fate, which isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Once again, I'm not against a Mia-led game, but I just hope they will be able to tell a solid story despite all the limitations. But probably my pick for a spin-off would be a great Ace Attorney related one, and in particular focusing on a certain character for no apparent reason. But I would love to see more of Sholmes or have Susan go on her own ventures as Ryotaro or continuing forward with the great Ace Attorney following Barack and Cosmo. I love this DDS cast so much, they're honestly my favorite main core of Ace Attorney characters, so of course I want to see more of them. But unfortunately, it's hard to see if or really when they will even consider making one when, while still being successful, DGS is nowhere near as successful as the mainline series. But a very interesting pivot for the series would be a true Ace Detective Investigations game. Not another Edrith game, but a dedicated investigations game with Emma or Sholmes or especially the big man Gumshoe being the main detective. It could offer a fun buddy cop style to the series, or the opportunity to do more dumb, ridiculously fun crimes and capture even more eccentric culprits, especially when we have our bumbling airheaded detectives like Gumshoe or Sholmes. Or we could even delve into the Edward Investigations route and focus instead on Apollo and Ayuda or Cosma and Barack, something like that. And fun fact I would like to include because I learned this after doing an Ace Attorney game show with Camp Dog and Mad Leroy, which But apparently Takumi's ideal character for a spin-off wasn't Edgeworth, but rather the judge? Which I don't know what the f the shenanigans would be following the judge, but after hearing about it, I need a Uji game in my life. And finally, a lot of people are still insisting they want to see a full on reboot or a new cast entirely disconnected from the right anything agency. Which, I love new casts, but the series needs to resolve everything before it's too late. Nothing is less satisfying than when there's potential or untapped story beats that will never get completed. And until they resolve the Lamiwara Paul Tracy debacle, plus a whole lot of other unfinished business, I need a new game before even considering a new cast. Yes, the 3DS games are flawed, but they still have a lot of great elements that are salvageable. And there's still a lot of people who love these new games, you can't just abandon them and cut them out of the picture. In the end, towing that line between what worked and what didn't, and just finishing what they have started in a satisfactory fashion, is what will truly prevent Dual Destinies and Spirited Justice from becoming the Rise of Skywalker of Ace Attorney. Alright, here's the big one. There is a very vocal group of people who want to see Phoenix f***ing die. Like absolutely perished, disintegrated, brutally murdered, everything. People are tired of Phoenix soaking in all the spotlight and want to finally get rid of him once and for all. And there are others that take it a step further and say that his death will be an emotionally devastating moment essential for Apollo and Athena's development and eventual usurpation of Phoenix. And if there's been any idea I've been the most adamant against, it would have to be this one. I'm sorry, but I think killing off Phoenix is just an abhorrent idea. Firstly, good luck killing him. Phoenix isn't his name just because it sounds cool after all. He has gone through the ringer, falling off bridges, being hit by cars, smashed by fire extinguishers and lead pipes, and the only thing that can injure him is his own frail back. You can't kill this man, he's literally in- but jokes aside, it will be difficult to kill Phoenix for the very simple fact that Phoenix is one of Capcom's golden child. And despite Ace Attorney itself not being the biggest series in the world, killing off Phoenix would be almost equivalent to killing off fucking Samus or Sonic the Hedgehog. Phoenix is that notable in video game history. However, even if we were given a green light to kill off Phoenix, there's still absolutely no universe I see Phoenix's death being done well ever. 
Firstly, there just isn't much sense to kill him off in the first place. He's an attorney that defends orcas and cross-examines parents. He isn't really making many enemies that warrant him being killed brutally. Maybe he gets in over his head to someone like Red What's White and instead gets the finger over his head. But otherwise, he's just a goofy defense attorney minding his own business. And Ace Attorney isn't really the series to kill off a major, well-established character. Ace Attorney does get dark, and by dark, I mean really dark. But there's also a mask of absurdity behind its presentations. That's one of the things that makes Ace Attorney so special, its ability to bounce between the lighthearted and dark elements so fluidly. And that's kind of the point. That no matter how dark and depressing everything can get, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel one can reach towards. It's having that optimism amidst endless tragedy and suffering. It may be the core identity of the franchise. But that's all evaporated if we kill Phoenix off. The poster child of smiling no matter how hard things get. It would burn out the message that the entire franchise has been built around and has been telling for 11 whole games. The belief in a just world to see the best in others and be the better person compared to and for others. Phoenix's death would demolish any sense of optimism or positive feeling you would associate with Ace Attorney, when no matter how good, how positive, how pure you may be, you will only end up 6 feet under. And that's not a message I think we or Ace Attorney wants us to see. Maybe you can argue that Phoenix's death could be that inciting instant for another person like Maya or Apollo or Athena or Trucy to inherit that mantle Phoenix left off, becoming that new martyr of the darkest of times are when we force our biggest smiles mentality. But one, we've already done that in the first fucking game. And two, if we truly want to emphasize that individuality of Athena or Apollo, chaining their development once again to Phoenix with his death feels counterintuitive. That in order for them to change or grieve or move forward, it once again has to be through Phoenix. Plus, all of these characters have already gone through enough suffering anyways. They've all faced their own trauma that parallels or even exceeds the impact of Phoenix's death would have. And speaking of which, while still very messy in its own right, we saw that Apollo was able to develop an identity for himself even before Dirk's death and without or even in spite of Phoenix. So saying that Phoenix's death has been a way for Athena or Apollo to mature and take the spotlight is very short-sighted. That's not to say that a death of a major character can't be substantial, as we've clearly seen that. These deaths are often the most devastating and jarring moments ever. They hurt us, make us cry, leave us empty. The death of a character elicits such a visceral emotion. There are monumental moments showing the fragility of our own lives and our humanity. It creates tension, creates drama, creates motivation. Major character deaths are some of the biggest turning points in their respective mediums. It's a moment that forces us and the rest of the characters to reflect upon the past, but eventually be forced to move forward. But because the death of a character forces such a powerful response, it has to be done right for the right reasons. A death should be a demonstration of the consequences of another's actions, or reflection upon the flaws of the deceased, or motivation for another's development, or something. And it has to be executed with precision. And that's what separates a death that makes you think, makes you disturbed, makes you hysterical, and a death that just makes you frustrated. And I feel a potential Phoenix death, due to all of these circumstances, is leading up for inevitable failure. There just isn't a good reason as to why he needs to die. At least with other controversial deaths like Joel from The Last of Us or Luke from Star Wars, they were deeply flawed characters in their Twilight period set in an ultra-violent setting. Phoenix is just a lawyer, let him lawyer for lawyer's sake. All killing Phoenix implies is that we don't know what to do with his character and just want to get rid of him. And that... That's just lazy writing. It's a cheap way to force out an emotion from the audience, but that only boils down to a short-term hit of devastation that dilutes into nothing. There's no reason, no foundation, no motivation to kill Phoenix. It's all purely for shock value. It's no different than arresting Maya for the 14th time or giving Apollo another chapter in his backstory. And it's entirely unnecessary when there's arguably far more effective and emotional narrative possibilities by just keeping Phoenix alive. Ace Attorney has proven they can make a meaningful, stressful, emotional moment without having to kill a major character off. Look at Farewell My Turnabout or Turnabout Trump for instance. 
So why do we all of a sudden need Phoenix to die just so we can get him out of the picture? He could retire and will be as meaningful or maybe even more so than just killing him. That's why I pitch that he goes on his own separate mission. He then is able to regulate back to being that mentor role, allowing Athena to take that spotlight. And this also allows Phoenix to move his story further along, setting him up for his eventual retirement or even be promoted to become the next district attorney or something like that. So many better alternatives than just, oops, let's kill Phoenix off. And once again, I understand that there has been some brutal and shocking deaths like Terry Falls, Tobias Gregson, or Dirk. But those had an established foundation and way more layers and depth behind them that makes them feel so compelling. And even then, for every Terry Falls, there's a Mia Fey and especially a Clay Turan, where they can be emotional, yes, but they're not nearly as impactful as they could have been if better executed or been more well established. Meanwhile, Phoenix is in a category where he's maybe too integral that his death will cause more harm than good. There are just too many factors and mainly unknowns that can and will go wrong, all inevitably leading to a frustratingly lackluster death that dismantles the core identity of the franchise. Unless Phoenix dies to set up a Ghost Trick Ace Attorney collaboration where he breaks his back or slips on a banana peel, we are not killing off Phoenix. And there were a couple other points I want to address, but this video is getting way too long anyway. Mind you, this was supposed to be a quick video, and it ended up taking me two months of college and life and all of that, so I don't know. But I want to leave everyone off with one final message for one person. Takeshi Yamazaki. Because I feel I, as well as many others, have just been way too harsh on the guy. There are a lot of Ace Attorney fans that have been heavily critical of his work, and like, they're allowed to be that way. But there's just so much negativity surrounding Yamazaki that I feel we often forget he's still a very talented creative. He's made some of my favorite cases in the series and has easy crafted some of the most shocking twists ever. Despite all my criticisms, I still believe he's an incredibly talented writer and director, just with a different vision and direction from Takumi, which you're allowed to take it or leave it. But I just want to apologize if I came off as too harsh on a guy because I really wish the best of luck for him. He has gone through enough vitriol from us fans when he has contributed so much for the series. There's a reason that while Dual Dusties and Spirit of Justice aren't really my cup of tea, I'm still so reluctant to reboot the franchise. Because these games are still so meaningful to so many people, and they aren't these horrendous train wrecks that many would imply. Personally, I don't think there's really an awful Ace Attorney game, they've all been pretty good at least. And there's still something special you can take following Spirit of Justice, like I made an entire video spinning a web with all the loose threads. There's still a lot of potential good stuff that he helped set up. So once again, cut Yamazaki some slack. You can criticize his work all you want, but at the end of the day, he contributed a lot of pivotal moments for the series that we wouldn't have seen under Takumi's vision. And whether that puts doubt into the future of the series, or a shining light for new possibilities, we will just have to wait and see, whenever Ace Attorney 7 releases. But you're telling me that GTA 6 got announced before Ace Attorney 7?